I'm uh, an aerospace engineer uh, with PhD in uh, engineering sciences. Uh, I got actually my master in aerospace engineering at the Polytechnic of Turin in Italy. Um, and then I moved to, to Belgium. I started working in a, as a development engineer. And then I, I got sort of postgraduate uh, in applied sciences and then a PhD in engineering sciences at the uh, University of Brussels. Uh, meanwhile, I was working at uh, the von Karman Institute for Fluid Dynamics, which is uh, a, research, a research center funded by some uh, NATO countries and uh, the Belgian federal government. Um, my specialty has been always the development of models and software for simulating uh, flows and plasmas in uh, space applications. And this includes um, hypersonic flows around space vehicles during re-entry phases, but also some uh, astrophysical phenomena, especially uh, let's say uh, solar phenomena in the solar atmosphere, like magnetic reconnection, space weather. Um, so after spending, let's say 16 years at the von Karman Institute, actually during this period, I also took a break, a sabbatical year. I went to, um, to Stanford and I was working on a project from NASA Ames. I spent uh, about a year, I could have stayed longer, but uh, for personal issues, I was sort of um, forced to come back. Uh, and then uh, in 2018, I moved to my current employer, which is um, the University of KU Leuven, which is the, the top uh, university in Belgium. And um, there I'm working in the Center for Mathematical Plasma Astrophysics. I'm a research manager. Uh, I lead a team, uh, actually more than one team, uh, working on different projects, uh, but all related to what I explained before, some in astrophysics and some in uh, more uh, let's say, uh, space technology. And in particular, um, I've been involved already since uh, a decade in the development of the um, Virtual Space Weather Modeling Center, which is a software infrastructure from the European Space Agency. I am basically the, the designer of core infrastructure. Uh, I've been involved a bit, little less during the last year, but I started the project basically together with others. And then, um, and then I'm also the coordinator of a project uh, which uh, is aiming at developing uh, next generation magnetic shielding technology for spacecrafts. And in, within this project, I'm actually coordinating a, a consortium in which there are about 30 scientists and engineers, um, all with different expertise. And uh, what we are trying to do is build a prototype device based on high temperature superconducting materials. Uh, to basically, basically create a, a magnetic shield around uh, a spacecraft and uh, mitigate some, uh, let's say, effects like uh, heat fluxes, high heat fluxes during re-entry phases that, uh, you know, uh, you have to, to shield with some thermal protection materials. And then also uh, the, the phenomenon known, known as uh, radio communication blackout. Actually, there is a problem of, you know, sending signal from ground control to the to the spacecraft. Um, yeah, so actually all my passion for, for space started in, uh, in 1983 um, after a UFO encounter. Uh, when I had to decide what to do in life, that particular event uh, was what uh, led me on the path in which I'm now. Uh, so basically I was uh, standing on a balcony um, together with, uh, with my parents. It was around the 15th of August of 1983. I don't know ex the exact date, but more or less. And, um, so we were standing on a line, basically talking to each other. And uh, at this moment, uh, we see this object appearing in front of, of the balcony, exactly at the same level as the balcony, like 30 feet in front of us. And uh, this object initially was looking like metallic, glassy, but as soon as we focused our attention on the object, the object started spinning at an incredible RPM, I think 1000, 2000 RPM, and uh, it became luminous. And uh, while, while rotating, it also shrank inside, in size progressively till when it disappeared while emitting a flash of light. And uh, the whole thing lasted a few seconds. But uh, it's one of these uh, experiences that you cannot really easily forget. And uh, yeah, and the interesting thing is that uh, within the same summer, um, I have a, an uncle from the side of my mother who was staying in the same apartment 
but uh, a few uh, weeks after us and um, and basically he witnessed uh, another object different from the one that we saw because the one that we saw was more or less maybe uh, like four feet in diameter so pretty small uh, and very close but uh, he saw a much larger one looking like a more traditional ufo with uh, like a dome uh, like a, a disc and then beams of light coming off different windows and uh, he saw him he saw it basically arriving on, on his left eye in the sky and he called his wife he said do you see the same thing and so they look at it for he says about 30 45 seconds and then the object suddenly started spinning became like a ball of red light and uh, and uh, he shot like a bullet and uh, and during the night they also had some sort of hallucination both of them i mean my my auntie uh, during dream time and he while waking up they both had the, the impression of seeing a face of a of a humanoid, but almost made of light and with sort of air. So she described it, I saw like a Jesus Christ uh, made of light while my uncle was like just seeing this face. And so when they compared their experience in the morning, said, ah, I was waking up and saw this thing you know, on, the, on the wall of the, of the bedroom. The my auntie said, ah, actually I had a dream in which I, I saw Jesus Christ with the, with the you know, hair made of light or fire. So it was interesting. So yeah, for for a long time, actually, I I really didn't remember this uh, this event. Um, it didn't really change my life. I was only eight years old, you know. Mm. But uh, like four or five years later, uh, when my uncle actually uh, brought up his experience, then I told my mother, "Oh wow, you remember? In the same summer, we were there. We also saw something strange, and that was a game changer." So after that, even if I was like only 12, 13 years old. I started researching as much as possible about UFOs, aliens, but also other stuff like spirits, monsters, reincarnation, you know, uh, Loch Ness monster. I mean, I, I was interested in anything that was, you know, paranormal kind of. Yeah. And mm. uh, and your interest in, in UFOs and your experiences with UFOs eventually led to you wanting to become an aerospace engineer and, and pursuing this career path? Yeah, yeah, because then, uh, okay, then I went to um, to high school and uh, I also got, in, uh, let's say, interested in astrophysics and stuff. So when I had to decide where to go at university, I was undecided between astrophysics and uh, engineering. But then I actually chose engineering because uh, they advised me to do that in order to find the job more easily. It's more easily at the time. Now maybe it's different, but at the time, being an engineer, I mean, it was a straight path to work towards finding a job. So I said, OK, there is enough physics. There is a, lo a lot of stuff that maybe one day I will be able to explain what I saw that particular day. So, you know, I'll, I'll choose one. And, and uh, so yeah. through your through your career, um, as you kind of went through at the beginning, you've done some impressive projects and you've worked on some pretty interesting, uh, pretty interesting projects, including you said that you'd worked for NASA Ames. Was that right for for a year? What were you doing at yes. NASA? Well, it was uh, related to the kind of research that I already did. So um, I was working on a, on a piece of software in which I had to implement a different model for simulating space vehicles. I mean, the, the, the flow around space vehicles. And uh, yeah, for me, it was a bit frustrating because that year I couldn't uh, work on the, on the same software that I developed. I mean, I work on a certain software for like 20 years and uh, I had like 100 people working on that. And also even NASA Ames recently through an uh, ex-collaborator used part of the software to do a specific simulation. But so I was like, you know, I, I wasn't in full control of what I was doing. I, I, I did perform, but I, I wasn't excited. And right, I, right. I prefer to actually yeah, come back to Belgium and kept on working on my old project and, and take it up to, I mean, I'm still working on the same project now. Right. Yeah, so you're so you're currently working on a project for was it the magnetic shielding for the reentry of aerospace vehicles? Yeah, so this is the major project that I have uh, that I'm leading. As I said, there are like ten different institutions involved in Europe, and uh, but I'm also working uh, on developing a new uh, solver for simulating the the corona of the of the sun, and uh, and this is used as an input to a larger uh, software to do space weather predictions basically right and uh, yeah 
And so, and I'm also working with other students. I, I'm supervising like four or five PhD students uh, plus other guys, and uh, and these are working each one on a different project. Let's say. Right. 